purpose is that God is the one that establishes his kingdom on earth, his kingdom of believers. He's the one that does it, and he does it through the power of his tremendous word, so that will be the focus of our worship service today. It's also a communion service, and uh, during communion now, we're going to be singing a hymn during communion, so we kind of put that on hold during the COVID thing, um, because we were going off the screen totally. So what we're going to be doing today is, during communion, then I'll refer you to a hymn, and then those of you that aren't receiving the sacrament at the time will be asked to sing that hymn out of the hymn. <coughs> Otherwise, all the other words are on the screen for today, and that includes our first hymn. It's number 406. This is the threefold truth. So we'll begin that way. God bless your worship. Turn to your 
their seats, and will everybody please stand up, and we'll continue with the rest of our service. <laughs> Which the first part is the invocation in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless wording and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do. You should cast me away from your presence forever. O Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died, Christ was risen, Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the well-being of all people everywhere, that they may receive from you all they need to sustain body and life, Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the spread of your life-giving gospel throughout the world, that all who are lost in sin may be brought to faith in you, hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, have mercy. For patience and perseverance in this life, that we may not lose the hope of heaven as we await your return, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord of light, live in us that we may live for you. Amen. <laughs> Oh, my 
truthfulness of the first lesson, namely that God is going to establish his church on earth, and he's going to use his powerful word, his gospel, to do that. So now Paul is writing to the Colossian Christians, and the gospel has enjoyed great success over there in that ancient city. So Paul writes, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel. That has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who was a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. So that's our second lesson. And our verse of the day is from that very portion of God's word from Colossians. The gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world. Hallelujah. Will they 
hatch? What do you think, Natalie? Will they hatch? Do you think they'll hatch and little birds will come out of the eggs? Do you think so? <laughs> yes, they will. Okay. All right. And then, Brooklyn, what's going to happen after those little chickies grow bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger? Will we be able to see them even without climbing up on a ladder? Will we be able to kind of see them from the ground with their heads sticking up, begging for food? Will we? We will. Okay, that's right. So this teaches us that little things, a lot of times they grow, they become bigger things so that we can see them, okay? And that's the way it is with our faith. Okay, listen, Brooklyn and Natalie. Brooklyn and Natalie, listen. Okay. <laughs> so our faith, our trust in Jesus, that's down deep in our heart. No one can really see that. But, uh, but after time, it's going to grow, and others will be able to see it. When people see you being nice to your parents, when they see you obeying your parents, and coming to church and listening to God's word, they are seeing your faith come out. Okay? So that's the way faith is. It's down deep inside, but it always shows itself. It comes out. Okay? Good. You did a good job. Oh, God bless you. <laughs> Let's bow our heads and say a little prayer. Okay? Can you just fold your hands? There you go. And we'll say a prayer to God. So, dear God, we thank you for giving us faith in Jesus. And we thank you for letting that faith show itself as others see us obeying your commands. We pray this in Jesus' name. Okay, thank you very much. And we'll continue with the next hymn. The next hymn is what we call the sermon hymn, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. Say the kingdom of God is like 
It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them, as much as they could understand. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. So those are the words that we'll focus on today, dear friends. In the name of Christ Jesus, dear fellow believers, I'm sure that a lot of you have heard about this scientific theory called the Big Bang. Of course, that's this idea that unbelieving scientists have come up with that way in the beginning of time, 13 and a half billion years ago, they say, that all the matter in the universe was compressed down into a little tiny ball about the size of a softball, and it all exploded, and it formed all the beautiful light that you see today, and the organized universe that we have. Of course, you and I know that that's just a bunch of, as they say in Iowa, it's a bunch of hogwash, okay? We're not going to fall for that one. We know that the true creator of the universe, the one, the one, who was there at the beginning, he's written the scriptures, and the scriptures have told us that God made the world just by speaking the word. He did that about 6,000 years ago, and it took him just six days. He just spoke the word. He didn't use an explosion. He just spoke the word. It's a, it's a great illustration of the power of God's word. Just think about it. So every distant star, all those galaxies, and there are billions of galaxies, all those galaxies were formed by God just speaking the word. His word must really, really be powerful. And that is the main thought of today's lesson. God's word is very powerful. Jesus doesn't apply it so much to God's kingdom of creation, but he applies it to God's kingdom of grace. God's kingdom of all believers. So we're going to take a look at this text using this as the main thought. God's word is powerful. It's a very simple theme today. But we see that God's word is powerful in changing hearts. Human hearts, that is. It's also powerful in building a vast kingdom. And then thirdly, it is powerful in the hands of those who use it. So those are the three parts we'll consider in today's lessons. First of all, God's word is powerful in changing hearts. So everybody here in church today has had a heart that has been changed. I know that uh, some of you might, uh, might almost doubt that because you're saying, hey, there's never been a time in my life that I can recall when I was not a Christian, when I did not believe in Jesus Christ, my Savior. And that's that's because you were baptized. A lot of you were baptized when you were mere infants. You don't remember the time in your life when you did not believe. But you had a heart at one time that was against God, was against Jesus, and was against this idea of getting full and free forgiveness of sins through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. At one time, you had a heart like that. And that's what the Bible clearly says. In Ephesians chapter 2, for example, the apostle says, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. So we're not going to argue with the Bible. If the Bible says that at one time I was dead in my transgressions and sins, then I'm going to believe it. So there was a time when I did not believe and when you did not believe, but then something happened, something changed, because as you're sitting here today, you're saying, well, I do believe in God. I do believe in the true God. You know, believing in a God is part of the natural knowledge of God. So everyone does that, but you're a little bit different. You believe in the true God. You believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you also believe in Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ died on the cross to take all of your sins away. You also love your Savior, Jesus, and you want to serve him. And this indicates that your heart has truly been changed. And I just want you to think about how amazing this is, that your heart has been changed like this. Let's just... Uh, Consider the following illustration, and it's a little bit crazy, but not really. Let's say that some random person called you on the phone one day and said, I really, really love you. I really care for you. In fact, I've done a lot to help you already in your life. You just don't know. And what I would like you to do is to trust in me, and I'd like for you to give me all of your money 
and all of your possessions. And then I promise you that after 10 years, I'm going to give it all back to you with interest, and by that time, it's going to be worth many millions of dollars. Just trust me. That's all I ask. Just trust me. Well, I think you would kind of roll your eyes. You'd say, what a kook. You know, what an idiot. What, a, what kind of a scam is this? You know, how dumb does this person think I am? But in reality, God has done the same thing. God has spoken to you. God has said, I have done wonderful things for you. I, in fact, I sent my son to suffer and die for you, to take away all of your sins. And I want you to believe in me. I want you to commit your life to me. Not only your money, but your time, your treasure, your talent. I want 100% of you commit yourself to me. And then someday, I'm going to make you rich. I'm going to give you a heavenly life. Oh, forgot to mention this one thing. In order to, to become rich like that, you're going to have to die first. Isn't that essentially what our Lord has told us in this word? Yet we believe it. Why in the world do we believe it? Our only answer would be that God's word is powerful. God spoke to us, not some random person on a phone, but God spoke to us, and his word is truly powerful to change human hearts. That's what has happened. God has spoken to us. His word is extremely powerful. Another way to answer that question, you know, why did this happen, how did this happen, would be, we don't know. In other words, we don't know the exact mechanics of how God's word works. You know, people who fix cars, they understand exactly how a car works, and that's why they can fix your car. They understand how things happen in an engine. We don't really know how God's word works to change hearts. And this was one of the main points that Jesus is making in the first parable that he gives us today, the parable of the growing seed. He starts out, he says, this is what the kingdom of God is like. So the kingdom of God, as we were studying this for the tail end of our adult Bible study this year, the kingdom of God is a word in the Bible for the working of God's gospel message in your heart. That's called the kingdom of God. So what is the kingdom of God like, says Jesus? He says, a man scatters seed on the ground. Now, in Christ's teaching, when you hear the word seed, you always have to think of God's word. Because nine times out of ten, a seed is a metaphor for God's word. So Jesus is teaching us about God's word. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. So that's very true, isn't it? You know, a farmer is not really a scientist. A farmer may not know all the things that go into germination. I guess there's something like eight or nine different steps in germination. It has to do with enzymes and all kinds of stuff like that. You know, a farmer doesn't really know anything about that and doesn't really care. All he knows is that the whole system works. And that's what's important for you and me, too. We don't really have to know exactly how God's word works. We just have to know that it works, right? That's why we bring our children to the waters of holy baptism. We say, well, I don't know. I don't know how this can work. You got water here. It's somehow connected with God's word, and this water is gonna gonna give this little baby faith, I guess, according to what the Bible says. I don't really know how that works, but I just know that it does work. And so then we're going to apply that to the lives, to our own lives, and to the lives of our children. Now, this raises a question: since God's word has come to us, and it's very, very powerful. What do we do with it? What do we do? We all have God's word working in our lives and in our hearts. What do we do with it now? Well, one answer would be do nothing with it. Because the word is going to work all by itself. That's what Jesus told us in this text. He says, all by itself the seed grows. So we don't have to enhance the word. We don't have to make the word somehow more attractive. I know some of you have shared with me that you're concerned about someone in your life. You really wish that a son or a daughter or a spouse would become a stronger believer. And you're wondering, you know, what can I do? What can I do? Well, there's really very little. You know, one thing you can do is just kind of step back and get out of the way. Just let the word work in that person's life. 
A lot of times when we tamper with it, if we try to make it somehow more attractive, then that just ruins it. I know of churches that have tried this. They, they, I know this sounds kind of funny, maybe, um, but church, churches have seriously tried this. When you come into our church, we're going to give you a coupon for a Big Mac at McDonald's. Okay, trying to kind of lure people in, trying to, to enhance the word in some way. And of course, usually those methods don't really work. In fact, they never really work. You can't enhance the word of God. It's, it's powerful all by itself. Yet we do have a role in the kingdom of God with God's word. And that is that we are to plant the seed. And Jesus Christ mentions that in our text. He says the kingdom of God is like this. A man scatters seed on the ground. Now, who's the man? The man would be you and me. So we are to scatter. We are to take the word of God and plant it in the lives of people. That's, that's what evangelism is all about. That's what mission work is all about. That's what Sunday school is all about. And youth confirmation class, adult confirmation class, is all about planting the seed. Once the seed is planted, then we step back and we say, okay, now the seed has been planted and the seed will grow. The seed is powerful all by itself. Now, this is a great comfort for us, isn't it? Uh, here I am, I'm an older guy, and um, and us older people are going to be moving on to heaven, right? What about the next generation? What about the kids? What about grandkids? Have you heard of this expression in the Christian church, the seed has been planted? Have you heard that? We can take comfort in this, can't we? As our children go out to college, the seed has been planted. As our young people go off to war, the seed has been planted. As Christians separate, they go their separate different directions, the seed has been planted. We had youth confirmation here a while back, confirmed six youth. Will all those six youth come back to church the next Sunday? Well, we don't know. The seed has been planted. See? So we have to have that thinking in our mind that God's word is powerful, it's powerful all by itself. Now that doesn't mean that we're not going to show Christian concern for the people with whom we've shared the gospel. We're going to show concern. We're going to pray for them. We're going to try to check up on them, right? And see how it's going. If we find out that the seed has somehow died or been extinguished, then what do we need to do? We need to replant. We need to replant the seed, right? So it, it doesn't mean that we just have this kind of hold off approach and we don't care about those people in whom we planted the seed. We're always going to be checking up. But we always want to have confidence in the Word of God. Have confidence. Don't think, let's not make dire predictions about people and say, well, those people, they heard the Word of God, but they'll certainly fall away. Uh-uh. No. But that would be like slapping Jesus in the face here and saying that His Word isn't true. The seed is powerful. All by itself, it grows and produces a crop. Okay, so God's word is powerful in human hearts. That's what Jesus teaches. That's what we believe. It's also powerful in building a vast kingdom. And we'll consider that in the second place as Jesus gives us yet another parable. In our text for today, Jesus says, What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. So the mustard plant that Jesus was talking about is different than the mustard plant that we have over here in America. So we have this mustard plant, and well, you've all seen the little seeds in your, in your spice cabinet. You know that they're, I don't know. A sixteenth of an inch in diameter or something. It's like pretty small, not super small, but it's kind of small. And that the plant grows to be what, maybe four or five feet tall. So that's the mustard plant. But over in Jesus's, where Jesus grew up, Palestine, they have a different kind of a mustard plant, and the seed is extremely small, a tiny little seed that you can hardly see, and it grows to be huge, the biggest plant by far in a normal garden. And the plant grows to be 10 or 15 feet tall. And it's like Jesus said, the birds can come and perch in the shade of that plant. So what is Jesus' point? Well, his point is that the, the kingdom of God starts in a very unimpressive way. 
in a very small way, in a, in a way that people would say, hey, that's kind of insignificant. But then it grows into a vast, a huge kingdom, numbers-wise. Well, that's the way it worked with Jesus, right? So Jesus, when he was walking on this earth, he started out in a very insignificant way. He's just a little baby. He's born of parents that are really poor. And then Jesus starts his ministry, and he's got these disciples. There were flashes of, 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 uh, of a kingdom that might be bigger someday, as he's preaching to sometimes thousands of people. Um, but basically, it all comes down to his crucifixion on the cross, and there he's all alone. All of his disciples you know, lead him, pretty much, for the most part. So the kingdom doesn't seem to have a real good start. It's very unimpressive. But now look at it today. I just checked yesterday on Google, if you can trust Google. Two and a half billion people call Jesus Christ their Lord and their Savior. Now, I guess we could look at that real skeptically and say, ah, oh, yeah, a lot of those are probably not true believers or hypocrites or something. But even if you cut that number in half, you know, 1.2 billion people, that's still bigger than China. And that's bigger than India. And that's far bigger than the United States, far bigger than, than Russia. So it's really true what Jesus Christ says. The kingdom of God starts in a small way, but the power of God's word builds it into a vast kingdom. And here's, dear friends, where we really, I think, we need to repent. Because so oftentimes in the weakness of our faith and in our sinfulness, we say, well, the, the, the power of God's word is, just isn't there. So when a neighbor comes over to us and they kind of sit on the back deck and they're talking about stuff, uh, we kind of hope the, in our sinfulness, we hope the conversation doesn't roll around to religion. Because we say, I don't really want to talk about religion. I don't want to share my faith with my neighbor. All he cares about is fixing cars and drinking beer. So I don't really care about, about that. I, I don't even want to bring up the subject. If I tell him about my faith, he's not going to believe okay, how wrong we are. And again, what a slap in the face that is to Jesus who said, no, when we share the word of God, it might seem like an insignificant thing, but it's going to be big in the end. And I know that some of you have been members of Christian congregations where you started a Christian school. And you had a Christian school for maybe, I don't know, 5, 10, 15 years. And then the school folded. And you had to close up the school for some bad reason. No reason to hang your head in shame. No reason to say, oh, I guess that was a failure. Christians never fail when they share God's word. Because God's word is always powerful. It might seem like it hasn't made an impact. But it's always going to make an impact. It's always going to grow the kingdom in some way. See? So let's recount. Let's recount of any thoughts that we've ever had that God's word is somehow very weak. Christ will forgive us, right? Just as he forgives all of our sins. He will forgive us, and he will in, in give us the power to go on and to share God's word in a wonderful way. Now, if we still have doubts about this, we should just think of the example of Jesus himself. So we'll take a look at point number three, the word of God in the hands of those who use it. So Jesus used the word of God in a perfect way. Right? Because he's perfect in, in all ways. So how did he use it? The answer is he used it a lot. He used it abundantly. And that's evident in our text. In the last two verses, with many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them. As much as they could understand. When he was alone with his disciples, he explained everything. So, you know, normally when we think of the life of Christ, we think of, well, he came into this world to suffer and die for our sins. That was his big thing, which it was. It was his big thing. But the second, second biggest thing for him was to share the word of God. And he did that in an abundant way. And here's, dear friends, where I think that we could be thankful that we are part of the Wisconsin Synod. Uh, you, you probably think, well, all Lutheran churches are like this. All Lutheran denominations are like this. But they're really not. Uh, the, the Wisconsin Synod of the Lutheran uh, faith is very, very outreach-oriented. If, if you just pay attention to the Wells Connection videos, practically all of them are about reaching out, taking that powerful word, and taking it outside 
the doors of this church, outside the doors of the synod, and sharing it with lost and fallen people. The Wisconsin Synod is really very good at that. And let's be thankful that we're part of the Wisconsin Synod, and let's support the Synod with our prayers and with our offerings. Also, let's be thankful for our local congregation. I, this is something I've always appreciated about Ascension Lutheran. And I understand that the people who started the church named it Ascension because they kind of connected the Great Commission with the Ascension of Jesus. Just before Christ ascended, he gave the believers the Great Commission. I've always been thankful for that attitude at Ascension. We want to make disciples of all nations. We want to take the gospel outside the walls of our congregation. Let's get behind our church and let's support those programs that truly do that. Above all, though, let's apply God's powerful word to our own hearts. If the Bible points out our sin, let's recount. If it points out where we've been wrong in our thinking, let's recount. And let's trust the simple gospel that says that we're completely and totally forgiven. We want to, we have the powerful word of God. Let's use it. Okay, dear friends, so I started the lesson today by telling you a little bit about the Big Bang Theory, or whatever you want to call it, and how foolish that is. How blessed we are to know that God's Word, His powerful Word, created everything. But everything includes His church. God created His church. He created his church with his powerful word. And that church includes you. That church includes me. So let's appreciate that powerful word and let's use it every day in our life. Amen. Will the congregation please rise? And having heard the word of God, we'll respond by confessing our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. And as we are uh, standing, let's offer a prayer uh, for our church. This is actually the 45th anniversary of our church's existence, so I want to offer a prayer regarding that. Also, it's Father's Day, and Emily Pelka joined our church, and it's a communion Sunday, so lots of reasons to offer a special prayers. We pray, Lord God, we give you thanks and praise for blessing our congregation with 45 years. You not only kept our doors open, but you blessed our church with steady growth over the years. Hundreds have come here, learned of Jesus, and been eternally saved. It was your grace and mercy which allowed all this, and we thank you, and we humbly ask that you would allow this to continue for many generations to come. Help our church to be a true church family, where we love each other, forgive each other, and teach each other your precious truths. We further pray for all the fathers in our church, bless them with a mature faith, and give them true love for their children and grandchildren, so that they teach the gospel by their words and by their example. We also thank you for bringing Emily Papelka into our church. We ask that she would be a blessing to our congregation, and that our congregation would be a great blessing to her. 
Finally, Lord, bless our communicants. Let them experience the joy of knowing that their sins are forgiven and that their love for you and for others is increasing. We ask it all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And, dear friends, you may be seated now, but we will continue our liturgy with the order of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who has called us to be his own so that we may live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and most of heaven, we praise your holy name and join in their glorious song.
And then those of us that are just sitting in our chairs at the time, we're asked to sing hymn number 376. Come for all things are now ready.
received in word and sacrament. We'll sing, O Lord, now let your servant. Today is nice weather. I'm going to go reach you outside in the parking lot. So have a great day in the Lord.